you know, he's one of those old school, roll up your sleeves, investigative journalists that, uh, you know, it's kind of a, uh, I, I don't want to say dying breed, you know, it's all in but, you know, it's, uh, it's not one of those uh, items that is out there. So uh, I'm going to let him talk about himself. Sure. sure. Thank you again, Eric. Uh, it's a wonderful event, wonderful chance to be here with everybody here. I'm just blown away. Uh, uh, accounting is something that a lot of times intimidates people. It's the kind of thing where activists always kind of hit a bit of a wall. So I just really want to congratulate all of you. It really shows on how informed our citizenry is and how deeply people care about things. I don't think if you ever, I get these debates all the time, oh, liberal, people don't care about civics, it's boring, it's like, yeah. Well, fill out to 25 people that came into an auditor controller's office on a Monday night to go through financial documents so that they can help themselves get empowered to hold their government accountable. And again, that is something that is central to everything about our democracy is accountability. You can't just, it's not a matter of things. The auditor controller said it's trust and verify. Uh, it, you'd be stunned at what happens when you ask questions. The other thing that I would throw out, kind of flip it, but I think it's a positive, is many times when you do these endeavors, and what we do as investigative reporters is lots of questions is a good thing. You know, there are very few things in life that you will understand quickly. You couldn't do that for the angels, you won't do that for any kind of sport you follow, or any kind of hobby you do. Government's not any different. It takes a lot of questioning. Uh, remember too, that after World War II, our government blew up to a massive size. It's almost a different institution. And part of that, it requires self and self-government show up. If we leave our government to be handled by a bunch of special interests, then we get the government that we deserve, which is not a very good one. Um, the key difference of our system is the self, it's the citizen, it's self-government. So in a lot of ways, I mean, again, you know, you guys are fantastic and you really keep me uh, uh, upbeat that you're here to get that information. Information is power. And that's a lot of times as investigative reporters, that's what we find is that the devil is in those details. Uh, just quickly, I'll just tell you a little bit about Voice of OC. We were founded in 2010 by a coalition of different people here in the community that decided that we did not want to leave civic coverage in the hands of outside corporations. Not to say there's anything wrong with corporations, but it's like having your family photo album in someone else's hands. We would never do that. Uh, I'm extremely proud that over the last six years, we've generated a readership of about 65,000 readers. We built Angel Stadium with our readership, with a community of people that are interested in government accountability. And that flies right in the face of others that tell us that, oh, people don't care about government, it's boring. You guys are walking the doorstep of that. Voice of OC is all about that. That's all we're about. You won't see sports, you won't see weather, you won't see anything on our pages other than civics. Our, our aim, hopefully, is to get to a point someday where we'll be able to have a robust coverage of every single city hall every city, every single special district. But the reality of it is this, our economic model today does not allow us to hire a reporter for every single city hall, at least not now. But one of the things that we can do is, you guys are the city hall reporters. It means you guys are the people that can actually hold that government accountable. One thing you'll notice on our press uh, pages is we're running a lot more press releases, city calendar events, op-eds. I invite all of you, as you start to investigate the issues that you're here for, Keep us in mind and send us your op-ed stories. They have been a wonderful addition to our investigations, and they really show how intelligent and informed our citizenry is. Uh, so uh, I'll just kind of start to move in. I'd like to maybe show you one little thing here that just goes to show you why asking questions is a good and important thing. I'm just going to show you here. This is the final budget of the County of Orange in 1994-95. Okay. This is the year that the County of Orange went bankrupt, in a billion dollar bankruptcy. And people have been arguing for 20 years about why did it happen and whose fault was it and should we have known and this, that, and the other. And I'm going to show you one document, one document, that if you had gone through and just looked at this one line item, you would have saved the County of Orange and the taxpayers of Orange a billion dollars by going through the budget which obviously the Board of Supervisors didn't do because they were not in a position that when this thing blew up, everybody started saying, well, it wasn't my fault. I didn't do anything. So, Eric, take us through the top line of this and tell us why it's, why it's an important little line. Well, in county government, the number one 
revenue for county government is property tax. <clears throat> One of it is the secured property tax, which is the property tax on your home. It's not VLF, like on your car. It's not uh, business property tax, which is considered unsecured personal property. But secured property taxes, all the property taxes on your home, businesses, uh, all farms, you know, raw land. And if you look, and this is the trend, the actual number of property tax in 9293 for that fiscal year was about 211 million. The next year it dropped down to what 230 no 130 130 130 million. 130, 130 million. Yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that would have been a problem. Maybe that was the reason the way you can read. <laughs> <laughs> then the rest, then next, the watch your recommended craft. budget, which we'll talk about the budget process in a little while. The recommended budget was about 84 million. Then after the adoption of the budget, it kind of they, they realigned it and thought, okay, we'd be up closer to 90 million. So that's a dramatic drop in property taxes. Mm -hmm. dramatic. That's an earthquake. Oh yeah. It's more than dropped by 50% in one three year, year three year period. Well, a three year period, right? Now let's go to the next slide. So now the next same <laughs> budget document, a couple pages over, we have entrance. The actual interest in 92-93 was about 65 million. <laughs> then it went, you know, it kind of leveled or came back down about six million, about sixty million, about five, six million there. But then for the recommended for 194 ninety-five, it's 149 million. Right. 150 million. Well, it was actually adopted was 163 million. And anybody that knows how interest is calculated knows that you have to have money in the bank to earn interest. So if you've got property tax going down, how is your interest going up? And again, that's the, I mean that's one of the basics of financial documents. Questions, right? Do I mean, you imagine what happens in nineteen ninety four, beginning of that budget process, if one individual out of three million people in Orange County would have showed up and said, I spent the weekend looking at your budget. <laughs> One of the things that we do with our reporters is to say, when it comes to budgets, I just want you to concentrate on one thing. Percentage up, percentage down. Percentage change from the last one. Now, you won't catch everything on the planet, but let me tell you something. You'll catch most things that are interesting by just looking at that. Had anybody in this county looked at the amount of, you know what that number went down to when the police showed up and when everybody started asking questions? It went down to about 10 million. Well, the next year, because we looked at that earlier, negative nine million. <laughs> and after that it kind of leveled off to around eighteen million a year or so. Okay. I mean it was a very, very, very small minuscule amount, which was the normal interest income from investments for a county. Anybody that would have looked at this document and said, Oh, wait a minute, what do you go from sixty five million to hundred and fifty million? I mean, what are you doing selling drugs? I mean, what kind of investment has that kind of that kind of impact? There's not one other county treasurer. John Warlock did point that out. He was the only person. And nobody listened to him. Well, and that's kind of true in the, in the campaigns, right? No, but I even, before that. Before no, no, you're right. He went to public before. document and he, two or public years, record, I should say. Two years say. before. Two years he before. This out. And he was also, and again, I'm not going to say that John didn't point some of this stuff out. The he question did. is this, though. I was there. Then. The document, though, the document for others to have seen this, was right for me. And that's the point of this. It's not necessary to get into the, the long-standing debate about who discovered it or anything like that. But it's a fair point to say, one CPA looked at this number and said, and, wait a minute. And I would make a point to, to emphasize your point. Sure. Is that he was trying to go to the press with it, and nobody would pick it up. Yeah, right. that's true. That's and, true. And as citizens, I think we have more power as a group. Yes. Numbers Absolutely. matter. So, you know, we, you brought it out one, one voice, but we needed many voices. Yes. Well, and the key here again, for the purposes of this discussion, is that you didn't have to have a CPA license to look at a line item and go, why is that going up by so much? And so I think this brings up my point earlier. This is going to, somebody would have to start questioning, you know, why is this happening? You know, if you look at the budget book itself, it's not going to tell you. But looking at that, that is such a dramatic change. Yes. Said, I don't know how reporters didn't look at this. I don't know how editors didn't look at this. Now again, I will tell you that county documents, and this is 
one of the reasons that we're here is you're all here. Sometimes these financial documents, they get to a point that even reporters, editors, other people, supervisors, treasurers, the auditor controller, right? They get to the point where they go like, you know, we call that discussion before, where they talk, you have a source on the phone, they data point harbor, I don't like what's going on here, no, 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 You go, okay, go to the budget, start showing me some details, and you never look for that person again. And not to say that one just for the point, but oftentimes as actors, as reporters, when we go up to look at a budget, it's a, it's a, it's a complicated, imposing document, right? It's like, ugh, I don't know, it's like going through your health insurance plan, it's, you know, why would you want to do that, right? Now, here's the key though, and this was the point that we, we put that line item up. There are tons of things in these documents. Now, here, let's talk a little bit about. Well, hold on, before you go. Sure. There is a terms of information in the financial department. I don't think there was, I'd be looking at it. Okay, great point about how those are a little tougher to get, but let me tell you something. Have you filed a public records request for them? Yeah. Interesting. And you're not getting, well, let's talk about that a little bit as we get into this next issue of audits. Because one of the things that you also want to do as activists is make officials work for you. It's the job they're supposed to be doing. Now, what you're going to get in this class, we hope, is part of an education to begin to know how to ask specific questions. Because unfortunately, and I will tell all of you this, under the California Public Records Act, government officials are required to help you find the information that you are looking for. Now, remember, that's a very important distinction. It isn't just that they're required to give you what you asked for. They are required to help you find what you want to find. So when you go after officials, you want to keep asking. Now, do they always do that? No. The reality of it is that there's a way our government is supposed to function, and there's a way that it functions. And the two are not always the same. But you guys have the answer to that in the sense of staying on top of them. It is not always easy. It is a long road. Many of you here have run recalls, campaigns, elections. So you know what I'm telling you on that. So let's talk a little bit about some of the documentation that's out there when you're an actor. So for those uh, people here that are from Dana Point, let's talk a little bit about specifically, we can go into what the auditor controller does. In addition to some of these government documents that we're going to be talking about tonight, you have an auditor controller that is in charge of keeping an eye on a lot of finances. They do a lot of regular audits. We get them a lot of times as reporters. They send this to us. I'm sure if you get on their mailing list, they'll do the same and send you some. Yeah, and maybe Eric, you can talk a little bit about audits in general, that some of them are just very routine. They don't have much in them. You still, I think, I still learn something from looking at regular government audits. And, and those are very interesting. There's two areas. The audit reports, even if they're not having a lot of findings, will tell you detail about how the government runs. Yeah. Because it is a review of those procedures and whether they're being followed or not. The other area, on which we'll get into the CAFR, is the footnotes as well. It gives you a lot of data. I have, I, have, I, have, I have two functions in my office, auditor and controller. Auditor is the county auditor, which does internal audits for all the county departments and accounts. The second is the controller, which is the chief accountant of the, of the county. So I keep the books and write the checks. This audit we did a couple of, you know, out in April. April 1st, was it meant to be a, a joke there? Mm -hmm. By the way, you have an audit page that anybody here can go to and you can look up past audits for Yes, yeah, so we all of those online by year and they're there. Our website, yeah. Which is brand new today. Yes, yeah, so oh. we, we just launched our new website. <laughs> uh, all of our documents are there. We're also trying to put the checkbook and some other items. But this audit started with uh, what we call a lease revenue audit. One of the things that we lease out county property to vendors, in this case the, the operator of the DNM Point Marina Inn, is we want to go back and look and make sure we're collecting the revenue for the county that's actually being generated there. As part of this audit, we went in and looked at it, and the good news is we found that they were reporting all the revenue they were supposed to to us. But as a other item in this audit, we looked through and found that there was a discount program that was not I find a discount program because that's not something that's well, perfectly easy. To part do. of the contract with this operator was that they were allowed to do any normal industry discounts, like AAA. You to you get your AAA discount. So part of this was when we were looking at that, we saw the AAA and all the other discounts there. There was this friends and family program. So we started digging into that. 
part of that friends and family program was, okay, this was for employees down at the Dana Point Harbor. It was expanded to include county employees at the Dana Point Harbor. The problem with that, in order to have that kind of program within the county, the board has to ratify it and vet it and make sure that it's following all the rules, laws, regulations. When we dug into this one, we found that this program had not gone through the board and had no board action actually created this program. So that's what created the problem. Now, this is a, an example of an or, ordinary audit where something that shouldn't have been taking place was found and we were able to work on it. This program is no longer in, a, in effect now. It's gone. Uh, it's not to say that it couldn't come back if it was properly vetted and went through all the legal hurdles. Do you always do follow-ups on this kind of stuff, or do you go back? Yes, part of our standard operating procedure is there's usually a six-month follow-up and then an annual follow-up after that to make sure that any recommendations that are made during these audits are actually implemented and that they're working correctly in case there's any tweaks that need to be done after. So again, if you're, if you're a data point activist and you see an audit come up, you know now that in six months there's going to be some sort of follow-up. Rod, do you have a question? Yeah, it's kind of multiple levels of Uh, yes, you know, revenue lease audit, we're looking primarily at the controls around the revenue generated by this contract. Others we'll look at procurement, for, let's say, and we would look into making sure that uh, the procurement rules, there's a procurement manual that are being followed and that the, you know, the RFPs are going out, they're being done the correct way, uh, and all the you know, I's are dotted and the T's are crossed in that process. Now, one quick question for you is kind of a good segue into kind of beginning to talk about uh, some of the terms that we're going to be talking about today and some of these different government accounting uh, uses that I uh, utilize. So Eric, maybe you can run us just a little bit about some of the differences what we'll see in public sector accounting versus private sector accounting and some of the different accounts that you're dealing with. Right. I spent a, a good portion of my career in the public sector and doing public sector accounting. Public or even private sector accounting. Private sector accounting, the objective is how do you determine your profit? You know, are you making enough money to sustain your business? So your revenues at the top are directly uh, in tied to a product or service. In governmental accounting, there's a real disconnect because you know you have tax money coming in. Unless it's restricted, it can go to any purpose for government. That's legal in general. You know. So you have these general fund money coming in. So that's a big difference. Now you, you, the other thing is the objectives. Private sector is definitely for the objective of figuring out if a business is sustainable, if it's returning to investors their, their, you know, their proper rate of return. And government is really supposed to track the flows of resources towards different programs. Are we spending money on public safety, you know, social welfare? different one. So really the accounting is to try to find what is being spent or what resources are being applied to different areas of concern within the government and their programs. Now you've talked about this before, but in a sense you've used a term a lot that I like, which is called 3D chess. Right. Roger, you raised a question about, I've asked for some of these public records requests about financial documents from the, the, the harbor. The, the trick or the, you know, government is full of code sometimes. It's like you have to know exactly, it's like software. You have to know exactly what to ask for. And one of the things that I like this term of 3D chess. Yeah, it is 3D chess. And just to, to dovetail on that a little bit is, you know, even different governmental agencies have different terms for things. I, I spent seven years working for the DA in the county of Riverside. It's another county. A lot of, it's similar things to Orange County. When I took office here, I had to learn a whole new language because Orange County has its own terminology for things. So when you're looking at these items, you really have to kind of chime in or really understand the language of the organization that you're working with. Because they're going to have their own alphabet soup of, soup of terminologies. And once you learn that, you'll be able to find what you're looking for more. And the reason this is 3D chess is because in governmental accounting, you have different funds. And it's different departments. And each of these departments have a similar chart of accounts for all the expenses and revenues, but they also are different, they're split up. You know, big departments such as the sheriff actually 
spill over to maybe 10 or 11 different departments that they're managing for that one bigger department at the other one. So that's why it's a 3D chess game, because you're dealing with different funds, and different items, and different areas. And you really have to be mindful of that when you're trying to look at something or, or find out about something within the, uh, the books. So let's talk about the first chess piece, because I think the great point that Eric just made, which is, when it comes to this type of forensic accounting, that's what you guys are going to be doing is after this. You're really trying to get a sense of it. You're going to be marrying a lot of different documents and intel that you're going to be getting from talking to the agencies. So in some cases, we're going to start to run you through those now, beginning with the budget. Obviously, the budget is the very first sort of financial document of each fiscal year. It's if you, a lot of times, even reporters mistakenly approach the budget as if they spent this this year, or this is what's going to happen. When in reality, the budget is just a one-time discussion. It's like sitting around the table in your own family when you say, okay, what are our priorities? Are we going to take a vacation this year? Are we going to put a new roof on the house? Are we going to send one of the kids to college? Is there an expense now, a loan that I have that I don't have anymore? Then six months, we paid off the car. What are we going to do with that extra money? So it's really no different in that sense. A lot of it is just the planning. It's a statement of priority. Just because I budget, in fact, a lot of politicians will budget one thing, and when everybody goes home, hugging themselves, and they say, hey, we got all this spending. Then, in the first quarterly budget adjustment, you find out that they reprogrammed everything. So it's a year-long process. But let's start with that very first one, which is a very important process, which is, it's kind of where you go back to this last one really quick, just so we can talk about the timelines there. Uh, yeah. There's some other important items in the budget. Yeah, for sure. it's, there, you had it a second ago. It's a spending plan. So you're right. That is the allocation of resources to specific programs. It's like, what are you going to uh, prioritize in your spending and your efforts on as an agency? The second thing, and this is very important in my day-to-day -day job, is spending authority. I write every check for the county, but I do not have the authority by myself to disperse county funds unless it's in an approved budget by the board. There's a similar rule in city councils and school boards. Until there's a spending authority in place, those of us who are working within the, the bureaucracy cannot spend the money. So spending authority is very important. Rules on spending, it will tell us what areas that we can spend the money on. Caps on spending, obviously we can't go over budget. If something's over budget, it has to be reviewed and changed. And the other thing is trends and assumptions. They're always built in the budgets. You know, we assume what next year's revenue are going to be. You know, we, we do all the scientific on property values going up and we make an assumption. Uh, the news article the other over the weekend that came out on the Prop 172, assumption done on sales tax revenues, we found out that there was a miscalculation in the state and that's going to affect us. So there are assumptions in there as well. Can go back one slide? Because I just want to go over these timelines. Back one more? Okay, we'll go over. I just need the uh, budget process stages. I just want to go over these timelines. I think there's something You had it. Because it happened this one more forward. I don't know. No, it's forward. We're back to do something. Back, one more again, one more. Okay, yeah. These dates here, I just want to make sure that everybody understands the quarterly adjustments. Okay, so a budget is adopted at one point, that's usually at the end of June. Okay, and then you're set going for your fiscal year. You work on the budget, it starts much earlier than June. It's a great point. You, you know, we usually start the process for next year in January. The, my office has to submit theirs to the executive office sometime in March. Right. So we're almost six months before the new year, before we, you know, before the next year that we're already trying to trend and calculate next year's. So what do you need? What do you think happens during an act is that you show up for even the budget hearings? You're showing up for decisions that have largely already been made. There's very little room to adjust in June. What you want to be doing as activists is start asking questions about budget preparations in January so that before you decide what you're going to do, you have a chance to impact and go to public records. Uh, you can go to public comment period during the supervisor's meeting. You can you know, give more information to these policymakers as they're putting it apart. And you can imagine, even from a, just a, a general point, if I sit there and I put together an entire budget, and then at the very last minute while I'm ready to approve it, I get a question out of nowhere and raising legitimate questions. 
But if you wait until the, the budget is already done, you can imagine it's it's like a it's like a bed that's been made. If you start adjusting things, you got to adjust things over here, and just natural human tendencies are to not want to do that. So these this is at your first meeting. Now the other thing is this: when these adjustments are occurring too, there's a public document that comes up in front of the supervisors, and it's going to tell you. We overestimated Prop 172, and so we're going to move it into this direction. Now, I will tell you, and this is just a general comment, during these quarterly budget uh, adjustments, pretty much a lot of your money that you had allocated for something else goes to law enforcement. Because those are the two agencies that are best represented in terms of lobbying for funds. The district attorney and the sheriff. So whether it's data point, whether it's social services, whether it's health care, all of those typically get underfunded at those quarterly budget updates. And a lot of that money moves into the law enforcement. Uh, data uh, point is a special fund. Well, exactly. Data point is, a, uh, and we'll go over that now, about special funds versus other types of things where monies are actually seg segregated and can't go out that way. But what ends up happening is that, and I guess it's coming back now as a department, but there are different ways, as Eric mentioned, there's lots of different funds that impact agencies and things. Fair enough. So that one. But I'm hearing that data points can be brought back into the parks department. That's one thing I'm hearing. Reporting. Reporting. It's still fun. Well, the fund is the fund. You're right. And this is where, and, and again. There's special revenues yeah. down there that have to be spent in that area as well. And this is where maybe, again, we got a good transition because, again, you get back to this collection of funds. And, and the other, we, the fourth quarter, right here, it's usually called the cleanup at the end of the year. And that's because you get back to that spending authority. You know, you do have to have spending authority over, uh, you know, any expenditures made during the year, so you really can't be out of budget anywhere by the end, just because you need that legal authority. Can I actually turn now? Yeah. <coughs> So that's the key again, it's probably a good transition again, as Roger was mentioning that. Within Data Point Harbor, some of those funds, a lot of those funds are restricted. They can only be used in a specific manner. Now, what I remember when they were dealing inside the parks department, though, you still have a park director's salary. His park is spent out of the general fund. That doesn't necessarily come out of special funds. And I haven't looked at an accounting of that. That's the problem in terms of what page summary to our cost allocations. And again, maybe we can get at that in a little bit. Some of these things, I believe, there is a way to get deeper detail. And some of these, yeah, yeah. Some of these this is the main we're talking about. That. And some of these cost allocations, like CalCap, which is where we allocate overhead for the entire county, you know, we could have one of these sessions on just that. that that's how in the detail of those get. We're very complicated in how those do. There's an allocation Oh, yeah, we calculate every year. It has to get uh, reviewed by the state, and then we use it. So we talked a little bit, want to talk a little bit about that funding plan. So we talked a little bit about the priorities. Well, budgeting is the spending plan, and that's why whenever you budget it is one tool, but you really have to look at the accounting records. And the accounting records are what actually occurred, so that you can compare the two together, see if there's a difference between the way they were planning on spending and what actually was spent. Uh, that's a very important thing because there's a lot of reasons why money doesn't get spent or overspent. Right. So that's one area you always want to look at. And when you're looking at the budgets too, you want to look at that, uh, you know, we saw the adopted budget and then the four quarterly adjustments. You kind of want to see how the budget changes out over the year too. Right. And ask, you know, did we get an influx of special revenue? Did somebody kind of miss a calculation on something, you know, that's going to add some interest in the questions as well of what may be going on in, you know, a certain jurisdiction. And remember sometimes, too, the answers to your questions are also very illustrative, even though they may not be accurate. The way that you are answered, whether it's, that's none of your business, why do you want to know that? I went to Dana Point, we did a, a, a thing when I was at the register of asking for the contract of every city manager in town. And uh, we had an entire, you know, everybody would go to a different city hall on the same day. And go in, you'd ask and say, hi, how are you? Good to see you. Oh, wonderful. Hi, how are you? Wonderful. Great to be here. I'd like to see the city manager's contract. And all of a sudden, that face would go. <laughs> why? What do you mean, why? Do I have to ask you why in order to see a public document? Who are you? Do I, tell you, I need to tell you who I am to get a public document? It's like, hang on, man. go get to the lawyers, have them come out. So right there, you know, something's up. Man, this is not an open place. 
So again, there, it, it, as you said, it's more questions than answers, but questions sometimes are wonderful tools. And then government accounting is based on funds. You know, we talked about Data Point Harbor. That's a fund. It, within our system, that fund has a code, just like every other fund. It's 108. So if you wanted to see something in my office about Data Point, the, the record, the accounting stuff, you ask for stuff that has to do with 108. On our website, we do publish our chart of accounts, and that would tell you if you have a specific department, you could look there and find that. And different funds have different types of accounting views too. You know, within our county structure, we have over 34 departments. John Wayne Airport, uh, the uh, waste and recycling, those are run as what's called an enterprise fund. Those are like businesses. You know, we have revenue, we provide a service, and cost recovery. Those are like that. Other funds are run differently. You know, sheriff's department, my office, DA, those are run as general fund departments because we don't really generate revenue of any sort. Of fund. So these are some of them. Yeah. General fund, which is all your general tax revenues. That's the most, you have the most freedom over that. So yeah. when that, that, an official says to you, we don't have any money, go with your discretionary general. revenue right there. And special revenue funds, that's. What percentage is the general fund? Well, it depends on how you're looking. If you're looking at the total, it's very small because most of the money goes to the cities and the school districts. I think we're about, and, and Claire can probably, or Tony, I think we're about 600 million? 744 million. Seven hundred million. Yeah. Even within that general fund of 744 well, million. Well, that's general purpose. General fund is about 3.1 million. So general purpose revenues of general funds, 700. And that's the point that the that's board has discretion kind of to, to, to spend. It's only about 3 million bucks. Out of a $6 billion budget. So that kind of gives you, that's why we have Oh, and then special revenue funds, those are revenues that come in, but they're earmarked for specific purposes. Like data point, right? You have a Thailand's fund. Data point revenue, Prop 172 is for law enforcement only. Right. Then, you know, long term capital <laughs> projects, those are separated out. That service funds. Uh, permanent funds, those are like endowments where the money's. There's not many of those where you just move off of the, the revenues on that. Uh, internal service funds are two types of the proprietary funds. Uh, that's a fund that's run like a business, but the only clients of that business are other county departments. Uh, the IT department is an example. Uh, Public Works is an example because they do all of our uh, janitorial and building maintenance here. Enterprise funds, I talked about that. That's like John Wayne. Fiduciary is where assets are held in trust. Pension funds, invest investment are an example of that. Also, the investment pool here is, is a fiduciary fund as well. And then we get into the chart of accounts. On this one, I, I kind of call this know the code. Because if you know the code, then you're going to get a lot more specific information than you might be looking for. And those are in your budget. Oh yeah, and while they're on the chart of accounts, that's on my the website for the office. Gotcha. Uh, here's some of the examples of the code. Everything has a code to the point where it's coded into the system. Department, budget number, budget control number, and then account. The account is one that you probably know more if you thought about accounting. It's stuff like salaries and wages, services and supplies. And then the revenues also have a code too, and they have very broad categories. Now, if you want to look at something from like the 10,000 foot level, then you would look at it in very specific you know, services and supplies, salaries and benefits, revenues the same way. They come in very broad categories, but you can drill down and actually get more detail where some of those revenues come from as well. So, for example, I mean, if you were sitting there and had a uh, council or a different jurisdiction that wanted to do spending in a different area than what you would like to see happen as an, as an activist, as a person, then you can start to look at some of these different codes to begin to see monies in other sides. And again, a city manager, other types of governing types will say to you, we don't have any money, which is all I always laugh at. We have money to spend somewhere else. So the question is to figure out from the public, what are your priorities? And these codes allow you, just like you would look at your home budget, you know, one of the things that I do a lot of times is take all the zeros off and think about your home budget. My home budget's 100 bucks. 
I have a hundred bucks. What do I spend on cops? What do I spend on fire? What do I spend on my roof? What do I spend on? Then you can start to kind of understand. And when the city manager says we don't have any money, you go, what do you mean? I see that you spent all this money on X through this code or through this expenditure, puts you in a very much more powerful position. And I think it's time for maybe a little bit of trivia questions. Great. <laughs> we do have some, some giveaways. We have a few trivia questions here. It's all right. For those of you who have pets, we have a very nice taxpayer watchdog uh, bandana. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have the questions there. We'll do, we'll do two right now, and then we'll All right, first, what year did Orange County declare bankruptcy? I think went first. 1994. Correct. You get your bandana. What size dog do you want? <laughs> <laughs> the dog is you pay, brown. You the dog is more brown, brown now. No. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> no cats. Small child. Then maybe you can make a friend and give a bandana to somebody. Yeah, I'll wear that myself. <laughs> <laughs> you better give me the big one. Sure. Yeah. All right. All right. Orange County was given its name as part of the campaign to secede from LA County in what year did we secede from Los Angeles County? 1888. Yeah. That was 1888. Now there's an interesting one. I've got 1888. Yeah. Let's go with the number I have here. Anybody? I'll tell you that. I don't know, you can't. 1880. Did you get it? Did the auditor shut that one down? I don't know. Can we... Uh, You're the auditor. Is it, is it a fair to let you answer the question? It's unfair. It's not, but we don't have any other hands up. We'll do one of the other questions. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll move on to the next one. No, no, no. I'm not going to take the front. Let's see here. All right. Where did the name Orange County come from? Anybody? Where did we get the name Orange County? Well, not at that point. I mean, think of just pure marketing. Hmm. Another the Hollywood Yeah. That's the hint. All right. Let's see what we got. Somebody said sunshine. Sunshine, yeah, yeah. Mediterranean Real estate developers marketing. Mediterranean. Anyway, since I mean, that's pretty close. I'll give you that. Uh, from what I'm seeing here, it was a, it's a real estate developers marketing gimmick to try to get investors to come over this way. So do you right? know that you give out? So whoever said sunshine, I think that's... Who said sunshine? Sunshine is close enough. Yeah. What size animal do you have? A big one. A big one. Give me the biggest big one. And now we'll uh, take a break. Yeah, we'll take a break. We've got okay. coffee and gift cupcakes outside, so about 15 minutes to start. Thank you. <laughs> by giving away a couple more of our uh, dog bandanas for those who uh, didn't get it on the last time. We're right, right? Okay. 18 There you go. All right. There you go. We're talking about finances tonight. How much was the total budget for the County of Orange in fiscal year 1516? Oh. Uh, zero. 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 Wow. Oh, so yeah, pretty good. Five point five. 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 Five point five.
So here's something, and, and these are these are pulled off of the financial statements here. You'll see fiscal year 12, 13, 14, 15. Fiscal year 16 is not over yet. We've got it out another two weeks before that, that fiscal year ends, so I didn't put that in here. So anytime you're looking at kind of revenue or expenses, you want to look at the trends, because if you see one year, that's not really as specific. It tells you a point in time, but it really doesn't tell you much of a story about what may be going on at that time. Sure, within that three, I don't know what it counts to. Yeah, three years is usually good for trends, depending on what you're you're trying to, to determine. Sometimes you look longer, depending on specifically what you're interested in. Sometimes ten-year trends, you get too long, it becomes historical, and it really is not relevant. Three years really kind of tells you. Year. Plus, too, if you're asking like a public records request or anything for 10 years of information, that's going to take a lot longer for the agency to get back. Typically, what we do at least as reporters is start with three years, and then if you run into other questions, then go back from there. But at least you can get your three year analysis. Quickly. So, as you're looking here, you see that there's different accounts there, the account numbers. That's the different types of expenses you have. Or actually, this is revenue down here. You had a question over there. By the way, we'll do a Q&A session. Uh, we get through here the next section, and then we'll open up the questions so we can get a little more into the discussion. I, I think it might be relevant at this point. Sure. I have a question, but um, I have not been able to find the answer to. Um, in terms of city hall, what is the service organization, so our employment costs are always going to be high uh, because of that. You know, when I worked at the DA's office, we were probably 80% uh, employee costs, but you know, we were employing a lot of attorneys, so they're high cost employees, and the benefits usually are based on salary, so that was a big cost. So we were usually, you know, 80% salaries and then 20% you know, things, like the cars. And we are over 70%, which means that we have less than 30% for infrastructure or anything else in the city. So um, the key question that you want to be asking yourself too is where is the where are those employees allocated? So if you have 80% of your budget, but it's all law enforcement, then there's your issue. And I will tell you that your issue is a structural issue you have in both cities because what you end up is you have. Of public security state here at the local level. Your politicians are much more interested in spending a vote to increase police and fire than almost anything else. And that's just a natural, doesn't mean they're bad people, it's just that it's a natural inclination that takes over. That's why, again, police and fire have a very strong representation at the table, both for unions and for elected officials. Other uses in government don't. And so that's why it's a little bit more on the citizen. here we get a trend of the revenues and something you're always going to want to look at when you're kind of doing yeah something you're always going to want to look at here is the change you know this change is calculated between 2015 and 2012 and so that gives you kind of a long term of you know where, where are the revenues coming from how are they changing over Years. And what are the percentage of total of the total revenues? Obviously, here it's uh, the property that's generating the revenue, and since that's Dana Point Harbor, that makes sense because you know we have a lot of vendors down there who are leasing property from the county, and that's where that revenue comes from for the, that that harbor department. So that's something we want to look at. Where are the revenues coming from? 
Do they make sense? Are they shifting over time? And it's the same thing with expense, too. You know, is that expense shifting over time? Where is that? Uh, one interesting thing, because somebody, I think, talked about outsourcing. When you get into the expense side of it, uh, there's kind of three areas that are in every government, if you look at it from the 30,000 foot level, that have expenses. You have the, the first one, which is the salaries and benefit. Most governments are service organizations, so you're going to see very high expenses in that category. And that's all of your employees there that would be in that category too, not just uh, you know overhead or frontline. That would be all of that. The second is services and supplies. If you outsource, those costs would shift out of the services or salaries down into the services and supplies because that's characterized as an outside vendor, and that's where all that. So that would be a change in the fundamental accounting. So if you were looking at a trend and all of a sudden your salaries dropped or went up you might have a situation where outsourcing is being done or being taken back inside the organization. So that's something you might look for in the trend line to give you some more information on that. What's that? Yeah. And every year, you know, this has taken off of the kind of the detailed accounting systems. These things are not out there in the uh, on the website, yeah. So it's a generated it, report. This is a generated report out of our data warehouse. Now, how could they get generated reports? Well, they would add, make a request of the auditor controller's office. So maybe you're asking. I'll leave Jean out of that one because she would appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> and she would just send it over to Meg anyway. So yes. you would send that to Meg. So that's but, the key here because, again, a lot of this stuff, you have to make the government work for you in a sense of but, put them to work. But one of the so things. Put them to the RAs for uh, yeah. If you want to do, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to put more of this stuff online as a self-service tool. We just uh, put up our new website; it came live last week, and we, we put the checkbook out there so people can see that. And we're going to be doing some other things where you know these things might be available for you, depending on. And, and it's one of those things where we see a need, we'll prioritize that. Well, I want to see more than one number every year. I want to see transactions. Well, that's, that, thank, you, thank you for segueing into my next slide. <laughs> now, each of these, now, every year, just a second, every year my office produces this. This is what's called the CAFR Consolidated Annual Financial Report. This is kind of the capstone. If you drill down on it, with, like is with every accounting, if you drill down into these broad categories, what you'll see is more detailed revenue numbers, where you would see, okay, these are for leases, these are for services. And if you keep drilling down on it, basically accounting is a pyramid with this at the top. So if you drill down on this, you can go into the next slide. This is an expense, and it actually came out on a legal form, and you can't see it all, but these are all transaction numbers. And if you could see over here, you would see the name of the vendor, the amount each payment was. You can actually drill down on that and see the detail of who signed off on that payment, where the, the budget authorization was, and everything. Is public information? Yes. Everything in your government is public information, despite what they may say sometimes. <laughs> so this, was, this is a way, so what I'm saying is it's like an onion. You've got to keep peeling away, and it, it will make you cry at times. <laughs> <laughs> Can we get this in electronic form? Right? We're working on that for the future. Like page. Page. Well, these uh, these things can come out electronically. Too. One tip there is go inspect it. Don't ask for a copy. If they're going to charge you an exorbitant rate to copy something like that, then say, fine, I'll just camp out with you for the rest of the day. I will look at it. Take a picture of it with your phone. Well, different agencies do it in different ways. But the other thing is this. They're required under the Public Records Act give you this data in electronic form. So if they were able to generate a public, uh, if they were able to generate a printable document from it, then they must have had a database. And under the law, they must give you the database. And that, there's no copying required. Well, it's like having an adversarial situation. Well, then move to a different country, because if you're asking for information like that, it is naturally adversarial. It doesn't have to be rude, and it doesn't have to be uncivil. But just keep in mind, if you're asking somebody to slip their own throat, they're not going to do it for you willingly. 
I mean, you're going to ask them, show me how you've misspent money. I, I get it from your point of view. I don't know if you're going to probably have a different opinion than me. Well, you're so asking the event or not. Meg wants to clarify something here. Almost, so the last year and a half, every single public record request we've submitted electronically, you know, in an email, here's the documents for, like I said, sometimes it takes a long time. Sometimes we had one that went back to, you know, I think it was 1908 or something. No, I'm kidding. That when it gets into huge archival research, we don't have those records. Um, yeah. But everything that we have, we give them electronically. There's only been one instance where the database file was so big, so big we that we had to put it on a thumb drive. And we charge, if if you want things on paper, then you pay, I think it's 15 or 20 yeah, cents a copy. And if you, we charge $17 for the thumb drive. So. Oh, but, but every but, other, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's not that volume of information that you pick can from the mail. And you would represent, uh, you would provide services to the Gateway. I didn't The Gateway Harbor, you would provide those financial services. Oh yeah, they're part of the county. It's, you know, yeah. it's in the CAFR here. It's, it's part of the county's departments, and we do the accounting for it. So we have this in there. So then, as Roberto said, it's Grandsons, no uh, as you said, just push. We push. I mean, and again, I think I called it an adversarial relationship, just like Congress and the presidency have an adversarial, an institutionally adversarial relationship. They're both different. They're right. representing different and interests. I, I use a different word that I make that. To me, it's more of the, you know, the loyal opposition. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, we work together, but it's, you know, it is a check and balance. Yeah. So I, I don't see it as adversarial. Well, that's very helpful. Yeah, but I do. But yeah, this information's there, and it's got a lot of information. You'll see codes on here, and once you know the code, you know exactly what's going on, like EFT, electronic funds transfer, and so on. So you know, it's, it's kind of once you have it. So, but when you're getting down to this level of detail, you probably have a specific interest, and and that's that's where these come in. Otherwise, you're kind of looking at it from the ten thousand foot. Uh, Mm -hmm. Are you bringing something else? That's not the website. Well, you so you've explained the CAFR. Have you talked about the CAFR? Well, the CAFR is, and this is, you know, one of the things I brought in when I took office uh, in 2015 was to make things a little more transparent. And we're working on the website. We'll continue to, to have that evolve. But we also did the citizens report, which you all have a copy of, that you know, we want you to take home tonight. What we did was we tried to pull out key items of importance and interest over the last year uh, financially. This last year for uh, Gatsby 68 where we actually put the pension debt on the books for the first time was kind of the big item. So we have a lot of information on how the pension's there. We, we get a kind of a mock-up of a county employee cost versus a private sector employee cost because we thought that was kind of interesting and folks might like to see that. Uh, so there's a lot of information out there on how that is calculated it's not always accurate so that was the one thing and, and this we're going to try to make into a more living document and change it every year so you won't keep seeing the same items year after year we'll try to focus in on what's important or new that year and, and we try to drill it down we're always looking for content so if you have ideas please uh, send it to us because this is something that we want to make interesting to the public and try to drive interest in their, their governmental agency. But this is definitely a different thing. If you look at it, there was one before I took office that it was just, if you were a bond trader or a rating agency, you loved it. If you're an average citizen, it was great if you had insomnia. <laughs> this is something we tried to make a little more lively and uh, to get people to understand a little more because like we said at the beginning, uh, that educated citizenry is part of our governmental process, our democracy, and I think it's important that we get this pushed out to folks and, and let them know what's going on. Great. So one thing is I'm starting to just more and more hands going up, so I was thinking we could maybe start transitioning to just specific questions.